DOE CSGF Fellow Emily Crabb in the field of Computational Condensed Matter Theory at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Hello, my name is Emily Crabb. I'm in Professor Jeffrey Grossman's group at MIT, and today I'm going to talk about the importance of equilibration method and sampling for ab initio molecular dynamic simulations of solvent lithium salt systems and lithium air batteries. I realize this is kind of a wordy title, so I'm going to break it down into parts, which will in turn explain my project. So um, first, I'm going to start with a background section on why we care about batteries and why are we specifically interested in lithium air batteries. So batteries are critical. Um, intermittent energy sources like wind and solar rely on batteries to be viable during the times when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining. Um, also transportation, if you want an electric car or an electric airplane, you need a battery to store the power. Then also just everyday personal electronics all rely upon batteries. But batteries are also problematic. Um, one problem is capacity. So the plot on the left, um, and the green is renewables, while say the blue and the brown are natural gas and coal. So if you want to transfer that entire blue and brown capacity to green, you're going to need a lot of storage for wind and solar power. So that's batteries again. And then on the right, we have the results of a survey in 2017 where they ask individuals about um, what range would be necessary for them to buy an electric car. And about 60% of people said that an electric car with a range of 300 miles would have them seriously consider purchasing one. Um, but say a Nissan LEAF today only has a range of about 150 to 225 miles, while a Tesla Model 3 has about 250 miles standard or 320 long range. So electric cars today are not all at that kind of 300 mile sweet spot. And um, it's necessary to keep pushing electric cars further um, to increase their use. But there's also other issues. There's obviously safety. Um, this, on the left, it's an electric car battery caught fire. Um, in the center, it's a Samsung Note 7. There was that um, pretty famous scandal a few years ago where they caught fire and you couldn't take them on airplanes. There's also just the lifetime problem. Anyone who's ever owned a cell phone knows that the battery holds, uh, run, runs for less time as it gets older and you have to charge more often. There's also costs, obviously, the consideration. And then kind of maybe less obvious environmental, sustainability, and geopolitical considerations. For example, um, lithium ion batteries largely use cobalt, which is primarily mined in the Congo. Um, there's child labor concerns, concerns about supply stability. So in general, um, it'd be nice to have, I'm not saying no lithium ion, but just other choices of batteries that maybe have different trade-offs than lithium ion does. So I'm gonna talk some now about lithium air versus lithium ion batteries. Um, here's two schematics of the lithium ion and lithium air batteries during discharge. Um, and the biggest difference is the source of lithium. Pure lithium metal in the lithium air battery versus a lithium metal oxide cathode in lithium ion batteries. So um, this gives lithium air its advantage because it's pure lithium um, in, as the source of lithium. Lithium air has a higher specific energy or energy per unit mass. So for lithium air, um, the demonstrated highest um, specific energy is six megajoules per kilogram. The theoretical is about 40. Well, for lithium ion, um, the industrial is somewhere about 0.5 to 1, um, while theoretical is under 2. And then gasoline, in comparison, is about 47 millijoules per kilogram. But really, the driver for the interest in lithium air is electric aviation, because um, there's an estimate that at least 3 megajoules per kilogram is needed, and jet fuel is actually about 43 megajoules per kilogram, so somewhat comparable to gasoline. So that has really renewed the interest in lithium air because you need to go beyond lithium ion to really have viable electric aviation. But there's also problems with lithium air. There's a reason we're not already using it. Um, things like high charging voltages, electrolyte stability, low cycle lifetimes, poor efficiency and capacity. And some of these problems are due to the pure lithium metal. Um, you get more dendritic growth. And because of the very stable discharge products you often form like um, lithium peroxide, La2O2, which make it hard to charge. So our real question is, can we improve the performance with a better understanding of the processes occurring in the battery? So that brings me to kind of my methodology and results section. I'm gonna talk about what are ab initio molecular dynamic simulations and why are we using them? What systems are we studying? And then how do equilibration and sampling methodology affect the results of AIMD simulations for these systems? So first, just what is molecular dynamics? It's how you dynamically evolve a system of interacting particles. You numerically solve Newton's equations and motions to get trajectories. In our work, we um, explicitly represent all atoms. So in this schematic, I have 
a blue particle that um, has some initial position, some initial velocity at some time t zero. And the real question is, where will it be at a time t later? And you really need to know how to get the forces. So you have forces mass acceleration. So acceleration can um, be written as force over mass, pretty simple. And then you can get velocity and position by numerically or otherwise integrating um, from the force. But the real unknown here is how do you get the force? Everything else is pretty straightforward, kind of introductory calculus or introductory physics. So um, force is the negative gradient of the potential energy. So the real question now becomes, how do you get the potential energy? And there's two different methods. You can get it from classical microdynamics, um, where you have force fields, a functional form and a set of parameters to calculate the potential energy. You, and you get, develop these force fields by fitting properties to experiment or higher level theory. Charges are usually fixed on individual atoms, and you can't form or break bonds in most cases. And we're going to compare, in uh, my work, PCFF plus and OPLS, two different force fields. PCFF plus stands for polymer consistent force field. It's not parameterized for electrolytes that I'm looking at, and it's not widely used for these systems. And I want to use it to contrast um, with OPLS, which stands for Optimized Potentials for Liquid Simulations, which is actually being developed for the solvents and the salts I've looked at, and is more widely used in the literature. And then the other method is the ab initio molecular dynamics, which um, is relies on density functional theory, or DFT, where the potential energy comes from the quantum mechanics. Basically, you can treat um, a system of interacting electrons in an external potential as a system of non-interacting electrons in an effective potential. And you write the effective potential as the external potential plus the self-interactions or the um, exchange correlation functional. And that's where your approximations come in. You come up with some approximate form for this self-interaction term. But it's still much more accurate than classical microdynamics in most cases because there's no explosive bonds or assigned charges. So you can have reactions happen where a bond breaks or forms. Um, it's, so it's more accurate, but it's also more expensive because you have to do um, much more expensive calculations to get the forces. And we've been using the PBE plus DFT D3 functional in our AIMD work. So a typical ab initio molecular dynamics methodology, you generate a random sorting configuration of some sort, a box of you know, different atoms. Then you run maybe a classical microdynamic simulation, maybe tens of nanoseconds long as an equilibration step. And the force field selected is usually considered fairly unimportant, something you know reasonable, but not much thought is given into it. And then you can run one to five picoseconds of AIMD as equilibration, and maybe you can even step, skip the classical MD step altogether. And then once you've done the equilibration, you run a five to 50 second picosecond AIMD production run, assuming you will sample a significant portion of the phase space in that production run. But there are several questions we wanted to address in our work. For one, does the choice of equilibration method affect the production run dynamics? So the choice of the force field, um, and also just the choice of doing classical MD versus just AIMD. And then also we want to look at, does a 5 to 50 picosecond AIMD simulation sample a significant portion of phase space? Does it overcome any non-physical artifacts in the classical MD simulation or other equilibration method you use? So we've done, um, we developed a kind of interesting equilibration methodology for a comparison study. So we generate three random configurations of 50 solvent and three lithium salt molecules, which exact solvents and salt molecules I'll address in the next slide. And then we um, do two different paths. In one path, we do classical MD with either OPLS or the PCFF plus force field. And then we do some ab initio molecular dynamics holding the number uh, of particles, the volume and the temperature fixed. And then we do some ab initio molecular dynamics where we let the temperature vary, but keep the total energy of the system fixed. And then the other path, instead of doing classical MD, we do a high temperature ab initio MD equilibration where we start at 600 Kelvin, then go down a temperature ramp to 450 Kelvin, then 300 Kelvin, and then do the production run ab initio molecular dynamics step. So we have these two different pathways, one which is classical molecular dynamics, one which is um, pure ab initio molecular dynamics for equilibration. And then we're going to compare the properties like equilibration dense, equi equi equilibrium density for classical MD, or the lithium ion coordination number with solvents and counter anions to try and compare maybe with each other and experiment and see how equilibration method affects our results. So before I get into the results, I want to just point out what systems we've actually used. We use three different solvents, acetonitrol, DMSO, and DME, and three different salts, LITFA, LITFO, and LITFSI. These are fairly common in experimental work for lithium air. 
And they, um, the systems we used all were 50 solvent molecules and three salt molecules, which corresponds to molarities of 0.5 to 1.1, which is a standard experimental regime that we've been um, working with our experimental collaborators in. We looked at six different combinations of salts and solvents. So here is one typical simulation run. Um, it's a, about 10 picoseconds long um, with the nitrile and LITFSI. The box size is about 18 angstroms on each size. Um, the time step is one femtosecond, but I'm only showing you a snapshot of every 25 femtoseconds. But you can kind of see the blue lithiums moving around um, the, LA, the three LITFSI molecules also moving around, but it's really hard to get um, much um, concrete information out of one of these kind of busy simulations. So instead, we look at the coordination number as a property for comparison. So the definition of coordination number is the average num number of you know, atoms, ions, molecules of a specific species within the first coordination shell of a, a different given atom, ion, or molecule. And it's found using the numerical integral of the radial distribution function, which is the probability of finding another atom of a specific type in a shell at a distance r and with a thickness dr from a reference atom. And I'll show you a plot of this on the next slide. But really, the reason we're focusing on coordination number is because it's one of the few properties you can extract from AIMD that can be compared directly to experimental results. So it's a really useful tool in AIMD studies to kind of prove the validity of your method. So here's the coordination number plot. Um, the dashed red line is the raw data of the um, radial distribution function. And then the plot on the right is uh, the actual reference lithium with the um, acetyl nitro molecules around it. So here we're showing the coordination between the lithium and the four um, nitrogens in the acetyl nitro. So um, the dashed red line is the actual data. The um, solid red line is the Gaussian fit to the data. And then the black line is um, three standard deviations above the mean of the Gaussian. And we take the numerical integral of the radial distribution function at that point, which is 3.8. We define that as the coordination number. It's a little bit complicated, but it's a very objective way to set what the coordination number is rather than just eyeballing how many nitrogens are in the shell around the lithium. So now I want to talk about um, coordination number and the importance of sampling. So for one um, system, one um, like simulation, acetyl nitrile and LITFSI, there's three lithiums. And in this case, um, they have three, this one specific um, run, they have three different um, coordination shells. So two of the three lithiums are coordinated to one TFSI anion while the other is dissociated. You can see this on both the RDF plots and the snapshots of the coordination shells taken from the simulation. And um, this is a 10 picosecond long simulation and there's no associated dissociation between any of the lithiums and the TFSIs in the length of the simulation. So, um, and what we see is that two of the three lithiums remain associated the entire time, and one remains dissociated the entire time, which really shows the importance of sampling over multiple initial configurations and lithium ions, which is not always done in ab initio molecular dynamic studies, which often treat one long simulation as equivalent to several short ones. But um, we've shown here that that's not necessarily valid because you might not actually be running long enough to um, sample well over if you're just running you know, one lithium in a box with some solvents. And then um, also I'm going to talk about the equilibration method with both classical MD and ab initio MD. So all the experimental data in this plot, which is the last row, is from our collaborators in Professor Yang Xiao Horn's group, also at MIT. So um, and then uh, this is, uh, they also have a paper out on this if you're interested on the experimental side. But um, really what you need to know for to understand what I'm going to say today is that I'm defining association as an average coordination between the lithium ion and the TFSI anion um, of over 0.5. So on average, it's, um, the lithium is associated more likely than it's dissociated. So um, these two plot, uh, these two, the last two columns of this chart are the, um, the raw coordination number between the lithium and the TFSI, and then whether or not that's considered associated or dissociated. So, um, for one, the first result you can see is that um, classical MD with the OPLS and the ab initio MD with the OPLS for equilibration best match the experiment. So the two red boxes highlighted are both, dis um, both show dissociation, they're both the OPLS boxes in the experiment, and the purple box also shows dissociation. Um, this was a really interesting and unexpected result 
if we had an infinite runtime, we would expect that all the ab initio molecular dynamics to reproduce the experimental results. And we thought that our ten simulations of 10 picoseconds would be long enough for this. However, this was not the case. And in fact, we found that OPLS matches experiment for four of the six systems we simulated, but um, we only found match with experiment in one of the six um, systems for the PCFF plus and for three of the six systems with the Abinitio MD temperature ramp. And the behavior for the Abinitio MD with classical equilibration also matches the behavior for purely classical MD with the same force field in every case for both force fields. So here we see the two red boxes are both dissociated and the two PCFF plus ones are both associated. And that was true for every, all six of the systems that the PCFF plus with classical MD and then the plus ab initio MD were the same. And then OPLS with just classical MD and OPLS with classical followed by ab initio also matched. So the reason that classical MD with OPLS seems to outperform the ab initio MD with um, the pure ab initio MD is that the classical MD runs much longer. Um, so the um, classical MD, the equilibration step is 100 nanoseconds. And then you only do 10 picoseconds of the actual ab initio MD. So the um, classical MD um, averages over four or more configurations. So you get slightly better agreement with experiment. And the OPLS um, is faster. Um, so we find that the OPLS um, is better than the pure ab initio, which is better than the PCFF plus for the ab initio MD because the initial configurations are better. And this really shows the importance of initial configuration for ab initio MD. You can't ignore the equilibration methods or assume a few picoseconds of ab initio MD or random classical force field is good enough, as is often the procedure in ab initio MD studies. So um, that was you know, kind of complicated, but really our main argument is that sufficient sampling and a physically descriptive equilibration method is necessary for ab initio MD. Um, ab initio MD is very good at extracting properties that relax quickly, like bond lengths or angles, that slow to relax properties like an associated ion pair. So ab initio MD is most useful if you already have a good starting point. Um, you would relax if you had an infinite runtime, but ab initio electrodynamic simulations just aren't that long. So you need to be mindful of the starting configurations and sampling methods. And this really shows the need to develop new methods that utilize ab initio MD's accuracy for energies and force fields. One um, that's been in use for quite a while is parameter fitting um, for classical force fields from the ab initio MD. So you may get an accurate bond length and angle and use that to parameterize the classical force field. And a kind of novel method that's developing is machine learning force fields that use ab initio MD's energies and forces and um, learn dynamics from that and then are somewhere in between the expense of classical MD and ab initio MD. So um, with that, I'd like to thank um, my funding um, resources um, like Shell has funded a lot of this work. Um, the CSGF fellowship has obviously funded my graduate studies. And then we've used a lot of supercomputing time at Exceed and NERS. And now I'll take questions. Thank you.